Well, there, there are times that I think President Biden is being advised by the uh, marketing team at Budweiser. Ah, yes. Senator John Kennedy and uh, Lunch Bucket Joe Biden, to be sure. There are many mysteries around us today. One of them is how Lunch Bucket Joe became president of the United States, and another one is why he's still president of the United States. It's good to have a very friendly, friendly news media That uh, one-year suspension in New York of the statute of limitations or the statutes of limitations just long enough to prosecute Donald Trump. And again, if this lawyer was aware that other women or other people had taken advantage of this suspension of the statutes of limitations, I'm guessing she would have mentioned that. So... Uh, Perhaps they passed this law and uh, kept it in effect for one year only, knowing that they would need that much time to prosecute Donald Trump and only Donald Trump, and then then the law would sunset. That's the term they like to use. Sunset uh, one year after the day that it took effect. Thanksgiving Day to Thanksgiving Day, they they almost got their guy. They kind of got their guy. It cost them money. Um, This is a crazy time to be alive, isn't it? Yes, it is. The only reason, the Huffington Post, very excited, the only reason Trump Trump was held accountable because sexual assault survivors changed the law. Well, actually, the one woman who, uh, <clears throat> 30 years after the fact, nearly 30 years after the fact, said, hey, I remember I was at Bergdorf Goodman one day, and so the law was changed, and uh, Donald Trump was prosecuted, and then the law will sunset. Um I'm sure the New York Times is keeping close tabs on how many women are taking advantage of this one-year window uh, or not. Probably or not. Mm -mm -mm. You think, uh, you know, we got gropey, McGrope-face Governor Cuomo who resigned in disgrace because of all of the many sexual improprieties involving pretty much every woman around him, including women on his gubernatorial staff. Is it okay to say on his gubernatorial staff on the radio? Uh, and uh, his brother, Chris, Chris Cuomo, also uh, uh, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that stuff going on. And, and uh, gosh, let's see. How about where in the world is Matt Lauer? All the women that uh, Matt Lauer, I think that they've uh, been sworn to silence with non-disclosure agreements. Remember when a non-disclosure agreement was a big deal when Donald Trump had a non-disclosure agreement and and uh, had someone sign a non-disclosure agreement. But uh, NBC News and NBC. And uh, then you may recall that the the CEO of NBC Universal was driven out of his job recently because of sexual impropriety. And with the suspension of the statutes of limitations for one year only, this is a great opportunity for all these network news women to come forward. No more statutes of limitations on this. Go back to the 1970s, you know, working at uh, ABC News. Something happened there? Sure. Well, there's no statute of limitations anymore, at least not until Thanksgiving, but then they'll give you the slow roll, right? And you won't get to trial until after Thanksgiving. They'll say, oh, sorry, that, uh, that, that bill sunsetted. Pay no attention. In Washington, D.C. today, because of all the crime and mayhem, Mayor Bowser. That uh, reminds me that they did that uh, dog contest in New York, too. Um Mayor Bowser is holding a a crime safety summit today on D.C. crime. And I love the headline. It's crime safety. Does that mean they're making it safe for criminals there? Is that what the summit is about? This latest summit will not be open to the public. Well, sure, they're Democrats. I mean, come on. But will instead highlight voices. They're going to listen to voices. A lot of them hear voices. All that. There are people in my neighborhood wandering around the sidewalk that are hearing voices, too. From D.C. government agencies, public safety sector, and private organizations. Privates. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser will meet with stakeholders. Now they're stakeholders. From numerous public safety organizations, government agencies, private organizations, to discuss ways to fight crime on Wednesday morning. That's today. 
The mayor will hold the Public Safety Summit. It's a summit, makes it sound really big. In a district office building, got a little powwow going on. Can't say powwow. There's a gypsy moth in the, uh, in the office here. Can't say that. And the uh, district building, uh, the district office building of the D.C. Navy Yard neighborhood starting around 9 a.m. There's a lot of crime down there. Metropolitan Police Department, it's a trendy neighborhood, too. Metropolitan Police Department Chief Robert Conti and uh, uh, District Attorney Brian Schwalb, Schwalb, not Schwab, but Schwalb, will be some of the district officials joining the mayor at this uh, event. Officials from WMATA, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, the subway trains, Monumental Sports, D.C. Chamber of Commerce, various campus police departments, and court officials are expected to attend. Currently, violent crime in Washington, D.C. is up 10% year to date, but it's early, so keep your fingers crossed. According to Metropolitan Police Department data, Homicides are up compared to last year. They don't bother to say by how much. That's not really important. This is WUSA Channel 9. Prior to this event, district leaders have announced other efforts to stave off criminal activity this year. That's a good idea. Why didn't I think of that? Hey, maybe you guys should do that every year. Maybe you should do it twice a year. I got an idea. When people commit crimes, you should arrest them, charge them, try them, and perhaps put them in jail for their crimes rather than putting them back on the street. Again, 244 carjackings so far, only four per square mile in Washington, D.C. so far this year, not even halfway through the year. But again, keep your fingers crossed. And nobody's allowed to carry concealed. Almost nobody's allowed to carry concealed in the district to defend yourself. There was that carjacker over in Northeast D.C. who beat up a woman and pulled her out of her car at a gas station on Bladensburg Road and uh, threw her to the ground, roughed her up, she was injured. And a bystander, a bystander, who was in the gas station, went over and stabbed the carjacker while he was sitting in the driver's seat of the car. Stabbed him real good, and uh, the carjacker punched punched it, punched the gas. Uh, Got about a half block away, crashed the car, fell out of the car, uh, uh, and uh, died, died right there. And as I understand it, the Good Samaritan... Now, how does that compare to the uh, the subway in New York? Maybe a little different. But I think that he's not facing any charges, nor do I think he should face any charges. He was stopping a criminal and stopping a crime. He should get a citizenship award. He should get a gift certificate of some kind. In February, Councilwoman Brooke Pinto held a three-day-long public forum to gather ideas from the general public and advocacy groups on what to do in regard to crime. Well, as my friend Marty likes to say, here's an idea to fight crime. Fight crime. Morons. He added morons because, you know, just for good measure. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? So they're going to do that. Now, uh, everybody knows that California is committing suicide. Well, really, the whole country is committing suicide. Um, and uh, that's, that's slightly unfair. Let's give credit where credit is due. The Democrat Party is murdering the United States of America and murdering California, murdering San Francisco, murdering Los Angeles. They're murdering Chicago, murdering Baltimore, murdering New York. And they're murdering Washington, D.C. You know, they're <clears throat> going to all the best neighborhoods and putting in homeless shelters and low-income housing in order to drive their tax base out of the city. Because, you know, people of all stripes, of all colors, of all genders, there are actually only two, Um, work real hard, don't commit crimes, try to earn enough money to move to a good neighborhood in the city where you can still walk to stuff. Maybe you want your kids to go to the good schools and the good neighborhoods, and then you move up there, and uh, boom, the city says, you know what, we're going to drop low-income housing right next to you. And they always say it's for school teachers and police officers. But it never is. It's always for uh, criminals who have just been paroled and are going to go back to prison again within a year. And now they're living in your neighborhood and your kids. And and uh, and then, of course, they, you know, all the mental cases because they closed down St. Elizabeth, uh, St. Elizabeth's mental institution in Anacostia years ago. And now the mental institution is the whole city. And I talk about this fairly frequently because I see the crazy people every single day wandering the streets, screaming at the top of their lungs, often in foreign languages and stuff. But in California, 
Um, they've got a. Uh, they've they're, they're ruining the place, as we know. There is uh, there is a, a, an actor from uh, yesteryear by the name of Scott Bayo. He was on that TV show called Happy Days, and then I think he went on to spin off a show, Joni Loves Chachi. He was Chachi, and uh, not Joni, because now he might be Joni though, because the things have gotten a little little different. Happy Days star Scott Bayo. Bayo, Bayo, announces he's leaving California due to homeless crisis, one headline says. CNN's headline, Scott Bayo says he's leaving California over crime and homelessness. He's moving to the west coast of Florida, moving to Florida. Happy Days actor Scott Bayo leaving California, not a safe place anymore, is another headline. Now, we've got a couple of audio actualities of uh, Scott Bayo, the actor, as well who has uh, resurfaced, and he actually seems to be a pretty normal person uh, and uh, seems to have been for a long time. He's married for a long, long time to a woman who is his wife, who identifies as a woman, and uh, according to his biography, he has two parents, and one of them is a man and one of them is a woman. See? Uh, so we got uh, that coming from. And here's uh, Scott Baio talking about why he is fleeing California after uh, all these many years. I've been there for 45 years, Jesse, and I've, I've watched California, Southern California, devolve into a third world country uh, between uh, the homeless defecating on the sidewalk, doing drugs on the sidewalk in the middle of the day, illegal aliens all over the place, laws mean nothing, crime is out of control, graffiti on everything, and... Um, all my tax dollars, I don't know what they go for. Um, you know, a lot of people feel that way in a lot of cities. The, the Democrats, and the Democrats are behind every one of these things. That, you know, for, nothing turns a place into a ghetto faster than putting graffiti all over the place. And some cities have gra- graffiti removal programs. New York City used to have a great one on the subways. Um, but the Democrats now, again, the New York Times today, has a piece that if you've got a problem with crazy, mentally ill, drug addicted, uh, like this guy that was choked to death on the subway, who had been arrested 42 times. And the New York Times today says, if you've got a problem with that, you need therapy. You need therapy, right? Uh, Which means that they plan on this being the program for a long, long time to come. And the New York Times is indicting you as the villain of the story if you think that this is not ideal. They're turning the, the city back into death wish and taxi driver after it took years and years to clean up because they're on the side of criminals and they want to empty the prisons and they want to empty the mental institutions. And, and we've just completed that experiment and we have the results. And it turns out you get a lot more crime and a lot more mentally ill people. Uh, here is Scott Bayo on fleeing the state of California. If you voted for what you have there, stay. If you didn't leave, uh, vote differently. Vote differently. I mean, I would vote for a Democrat if they were going to fix some of this stuff. I would. But I don't think the other side would ever vote for a Republican to fix it. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty clear. And uh, and again, this is not just Los Angeles and the Metroplex uh, there, the megalopolis. It's not just Southern California. It, San Francisco uh, is really Central California. Uh, I lived in Santa Barbara for seven years. You go back there, and it's a it's a it's an open air mental institution, and it's tragic because it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. But you give the left control of these places, and they destroy them. Uh, again, Venezuela was the most prop- prosperous, uh, wealthiest country in all of Latin America, and then uh, they handed over to uh, Chavez. And uh, look at it now. There, I think, what are we here? There are like 30,000 Venezuelans lining up uh, south of Mexico waiting to walk into the United States when Title 42 expires within a matter of hours. And uh, that's because, you know, socialism, which they've pitched. They're, they're repackaging and selling here in the United States. The Democrat Party is, it's real good. No, it's just free stuff. And it doesn't cost you anything. Billionaires will pay for it. Yeah. Take another hit. Not a fresh air. You know that you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh-smelling air, eliminate odors, kill mold, spores, mildew, bacteria, and viruses. 
The Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air. O3 molecules seek out odors and air pollutants, and the molecules destroy these nasty things. It doesn't mask or cover them up like a spray can. It eliminates them. It's called the thunderstorm because it purifies the air in your home and provides you with clean, fresh air, just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 American dollars on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack for a whole home protection. I have two in my home, but I have a small home. You're going to get three units for under $200. That's a fraction of the cost compared with other air purifiers that can go for more than $600 each. So you can put one in your basement, your bedroom, your family room. You can hold them one in your hand, just like this. It's uh, smaller than this. Put one in your kitchen, any place that you like to breathe clean, fresh air. And with this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Just go to EdenPureDeals.com, put in the discount code CHRIS, and save $200. You can give one as a gift, give one to your uh, smelly teenager. That's EdenPureDeals.com, the discount code is CHRIS, and shipping is free which is real good. Yeah. Shoplifting up 81% in New York City. Homicides up in D.C. again. Carjackings tripled from 2021 to 22, and they're skyrocketing again this year. Tell you what, if you're coming to D.C., you better just preemptively put one of those Apple trackers on your car because the odds are, well, you know. Hey, Chris here with some exciting news. Now you can listen to me live on the WMAL app. Doesn't matter if you're in your car, in the office, on the go. The WMAL app delivers crystal clear around-the-clock news coverage anywhere with cell service or Wi-Fi. So don't miss a second of your favorite shows. Download the WMAL app today on the Apple App Store or at Google Play Store. Now, let me uh, share a, a moment uh, with NBC News' Tom Costello on the television uh, this morning because Tucker Carlson announced that he's going to be taking his show. Apparently, the contract doesn't restrict him from doing a show on Twitter and Elon Musk now on Twitter, so free speech is spoken there. And uh, Tom Costello had, of all people, Uncle Fester on. From Remember, he got fired from uh, CNN, Uncle Fester. And I said, well, gosh, this sounds, you know, uh, uh, Twitter was a hotbed of anti-Semitism before, but what now? Okay, well, listen, Twitter was already under fire from misinformation, disinformation, all-out lies, anti-Semitism, right. racism, before Elon Musk took over, and now it's gotten kind of crazy, right? Seemingly unmoored, uh, if you will. Will anybody be able to police what Carlson says... Mm. Or is this the point? It's just a free-for-all. I think this is the point. It is a free-for-all. It's what Elon Musk wants to provide. This move by Tucker may cement the idea of Twitter as a right-wing website. Ah, uh, yes. It's a platform, uh, not a website. Uh, and that's uh, Uncle Fester, Brian Seltzerwater. Uh, wait, so Jack Dorsey was a racist, anti-Semite, spreading misinformation and disinformation? Well, that's, that's true. But now... Police, what he says. All right, let's. Uh, we're going to get to the mailbag in just uh, just a moment, a couple of moments, and uh, that's our weekly, our Wednesday uh, mailbag segment. From you, the nice people out there in in reality land, dealing with all the crazy stuff the Democrats are throwing at us. Yeah, Scott Bayo, uh, fleeing California. I think he has the probably the wherewithal to uh, go anywhere he wants, and and he's moving to Florida, as so many people are. Uh, let's go to the uh, let's go to the telephones, Michael. Let's go to Karen calling from Quantico, Virginia where we have a great big Marine Corps base. Karen, you're on the Chris Plant Show. Hi, Chris. Good morning. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hey. my um, I'm great. I'm great. Um, my husband and I grew up in Northern Virginia, but he uh, flew F-18s for the Marine Corps, was in for under, a little under 35 years, and we were stationed at El Toro, Miramar, Camp Pendleton. 
and have the unique perspective of going back over three decades back and forth to see the slow and steady decline of what truly is a gem of a place, Southern California. You know, you get there for the first time and you're like, I get it. I get why people flock here. And every time we went back, it was nastier and nastier. And we um, lived in a kind of a bedroom community called Rancho Penasquitos. And we um, put our kids in the schools there. It was fabulous. And um, on any given day, you could look down in the canyons and there were illegal alien, uh, you know, tent cities. But the most disturbing thing we ever saw were you'd see a grove of trees and a line of men um, coming out from the grove of trees 50, 60 deep. And they had trafficked women and they were um, they were prostituting them in the tr- uh, grove of trees. And you just I called the sheriff. I called the school. Um, my kids were at a school called Mount Carmel and they're like we can't do anything about it. And and it was the last time we went, we stayed in an Airbnb um, in Little Italy, had been there more times than I can remember. And we get up early in the morning to go get our espresso, and there's poop all over the sidewalks in this fabulous town, Little Italy, this suburb of downtown San Diego. And I asked the guy, I'm like, what's up? You know, are people not picking up? He said, oh, it's not dogs. It's people. It's people defecating. And I just, it was really sad. Just saw these snippets in time over 30 years with a, sl- a steady decline. And so I, I understand Scott Bayo's dilemma. You want to stay, you want to go back, but it's just, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I lived in uh, Santa Barbara when I was in my twenties and it was beautiful and wonderful. And I came out of Chicago and I found myself in Santa Barbara and it was like paradise and, you know, palm trees and uh, uh, beautiful people in a beautiful uh, place, Santa Barbara. And you go there now, and you have to be constantly on guard walking down State Street and along the beach mm-hmm. because of all the crazy people and the mentally ill, drug-addled, homeless, lunatics. And there were homeless people there then. Uh, the big Morton Bay fig tree along uh, 101 by the train tracks downtown was a famous uh, homeless person hangout. Uh, but they didn't allow the truly insane, crazy people to roam free back then. And uh, since then, the Democrats have said, uh, I mean, again, this New York Times piece today, where the New York Times writer says that if you've got a problem with mentally ill, drug addicted, crazy people on the New York subways, then you need, you need therapy, right? And that is, that's just, that's the end of civilization. That's the end of civil society. It's the end of the United States of America. And, And honestly, I think that's actually the I know that it's the goal of the left and uh, always has been for many generations now to destroy the United States of America, to collapse our economy, to collapse our our uh, culture, our, our society, so that really the left is the last man standing on the planet Earth and they are uh, totalitarian in their orientation. And it's the United States that has kept, and your husband with 35 years in the Marine Corps, F-18 driver, man, oh man, uh, just uh, couldn't be couldn't be cooler, and um, you know keeping the world safe for democracy and for freedom loving people, uh, and and it's tragic what they've done. Uh, you know, how do you wreck California? Well, you know one bad idea at a time. I think is the answer, right, Karen? Right. It was uh, it was um, devastating to see, especially in Little Italy. If you walk around, there's placards on a lot of the historical buildings. And that was an Italian immigrant settlement with the Italians. I'm, I'm, my family is of the line of Beretta. And mm-hmm. so I was intrigued. And this, this um, small enclave um, produced, they were the largest producers of tuna in the world at one time. And it was just a gem and it's still very beautiful, but we, we stepped out on our, our little Airbnb balcony at night to just watch the city live and it was frightening we decided not to go out you know past a certain time just too many people sleeping you could hear them all night it it was it didn't used to be like that and i i i I think um the the police their hands are tied we're we're big fans of the of our police force and their hands are tied and yeah you're just you're a hater anytime you try to do the right thing you're a hater you're judgmental you're you're you know not thinking about um other people you're only thinking about yourself and it's crazy crazy people in charge. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, again, I played this uh, audio of John F. Kennedy. I don't know if you heard this when he was president in 1963, saying that at that time in 1963, when the population of the country was about 180 million people, he said we had 530,000 people in mental institutions. Today, the Washington Post says we have more like 45,000 people in mental institutions, and, and the population has not quite doubled, but added 150 million people to 330 million people. So we should have a great many more people in mental institutions. Now, they ran the mental institutions badly, um, but we've just thrown all of the mentally ill people out on the streets to fend for themselves, which is not kind, it's not noble, it's not a solution, and it destroys civil society, and that's the... That's the government solution. I don't see the Republicans stepping up to fix this either. This is a, a national pandemic. It's a national crisis, the mentally ill. And also, Karen, you know, they've, they've encouraged drug use and, and said it's okay. Drug use is okay. See Hunter Biden. See, uh, you know, half the people in my, you know, there are mm -hmm. pot stores all over Washington, D.C. Everywhere you walk into, you see everybody smoking pot. And, um, you know, it's, they're not making things better. They're making things worse. They're making the cities unlivable. Uh, unless you're a criminal, they're making them very livable for criminals and carjackers. And and this is entirely on the back of the Democrat Party, uh, except in, uh, you know that the Republicans on Capitol Hill are not sounding the alarm and saying, you know, my God, this is a national emergency. We need to do something about it. And now, Karen, we've reached this point where all of our stores and businesses are on lockdown because the Democrats are strong arm uh, robberies are, are commonplace and the, the looting, the broad daylight looting of uh, uh, and, and those are strong arm robberies, too, of uh, everything from grocery stores to drug stores to the eyeglasses store to clothing stores. And uh, the libs just walk in and and, uh, you know, this is not a Republican crime wave. This is a Democrat crime wave. And we don't have the political leadership. Joe Biden, obviously, you know, couldn't uh, make uh, microwave macaroni and cheese much less run the free world. And, uh, you know, I got I to gotta tell you, and your husband flying uh, hornets off of aircraft carriers for, for decades, uh, keeping the world safe, uh, while in the meantime, the left has been eating away at the foundations of our culture, our society, our economy. And, um, and it's really coming apart at the seams. And then they tell all the boys that they're girls and the girls that they're boys. Uh, it's, it's just crazy, isn't it? It absolutely is. And I, I um, you asked me if I heard you reference Kennedy. Um, I listen to you every day from 9 to 12. I get very little done. I try to work my, uh, my morning around what you have to say. So, yes, I'd heard you reference that. But I, I think about um, most recently the, the transgender in the Navy um, that is in the um, recruitment video, and it's horrifying. My husband used to say, all the time, you know, I'm, I'm trained to, to fight. We're warriors. What is going on? We're, it's very frightening. We're not, we're not preparing our troops. Um, we're going to put people in horrendous situations when they go overseas to combat. Um, it is going to be very bad for our country. We're very frightened. Um, the, tra the transgender uh, recruitment video, I just, I can't understand what our leadership is doing at this point how they can sit in an office at the Pentagon and look at each other and go, that's a great idea. This is a great idea. Let's get some person who's mentally unstable to be kind about it. And we're going to put him at the forefront and try to bring it. I mean, we, we have many children. And so I'm around teenage young men and women that want to go into the armed forces and we can no longer encourage them to do that yeah. with good conscience. And, and police yeah. families and police families are discouraging their uh, sons and daughters from going into policing, too, because the Democrats are hollowing out the military. They're hollowing out uh, police yeah. forces. Uh, and we're all the worse for it uh, domestically because of crime and mayhem and anarchy. And, and you know, uh, we're going to be the worse for it um, because China is on the rise and they plan on dominating mm -hmm. the 21st century. And the left in the United States plans on helping them in that mission. And that is, you know, the, honestly, the difference between the Nazis in World War II and, and uh, Soviet communists um, was the flag. The flag. Now, one last thing. One last thing, uh, Karen. Uh, you mentioned you're a uh, member of the Beretta family uh, from the official Beretta firearms family. No, I wouldn't be near Quantico if we had that kind of money. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we were, uh, we were just... 
a poor immigrant. My mom's first generation. So yeah. Is that right? That's great. No. Yeah. God bless yeah. America. God bless you. I'm saluting you and your F-18 pilot husband. God bless you. Um, Thank you, sir. And uh, God save us all. You know, I got to fly an F-18 one day out of uh, Patuxent River, out of the Naval Flight really? Test Center. I did, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I got to do, a, you know, a few aileron rolls and a little of this and uh, that when I took the stick. Um, yeah, uh, very, very, uh, well, very nice. I want nice. to tell you, that's really cool. That's unusual. And I'll tell you real quick, um, back in the day, I don't know if they do it anymore, as a reward for our young Marines that were, were doing fine work on the line, they would go through a quick course and be allowed to sit in the back on an F-18 run and they would film it. And I would say nine out of 10 Marines would vomit because they weren't used to it. And then they'd play those reels during the Marine Corps ball. And you're sitting there, you know, you've got your champagne, you're in your formal and we're watching videos of these young people time of their life but they're either blacking out because they're pulling g's or right. they're vomiting and it is hysterical is, did you throw up that is funny i've <laughs> i've never i've never thrown i haven't thrown up since the 1980s and uh <laughs> that's it's actually true and i got to do an a6 intruder off of the enterprise uh All three right. times and and i got to fly an f-16 um out of uh, Moody Air Force Base in South Georgia. Now that I really got to fly the the heck out of, and I wow. I did seven and a half G lo- with me at the stick. Seven and a half G sustained loops and um, and spirals and stalls, and and I, I pulled a lot of sustained seven and a half G um, uh, moves in uh, that. And I've never I've never uh, vomited from any of that. Uh, I've never had motion sickness, and <laughs> and I, and I didn't uh, pass out. Now the pilot, uh, great guy. Uh, said, you know, you, you might pass out up there because we're going to pull some G's. I was wearing a G suit and everything, and they teach you how to pucker right. and all that. So I never, I never blacked okay. out, and and I never vomited. I'm happy to be able to say. <laughs> I love it. I love that you got to do that. Yeah, One me in too. A yeah, me too. Me too. Couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, listen, uh, thank you very, very much, Karen. I, I hope to meet you in person one day, and uh, when when we meet, you'll know that we're already friends. Very nice. I'll, I'm going to try to get to one of your events sometime soon. That would be great. I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, uh, boy, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm a little bit chatty and I, I run out the clock from uh, time to time. But let me see if I can get to some uh, mailbag questions. And, and one of them actually has to do with uh, what we were just talking about. Brian says, Chris, given your amazing career and adventurous life that put you in F-18s, F-16s, one F-18 and one F-16, Travels that you took around the world uh, many times, that took you around the world many times. Can you share with us any specific moment that you define as a close call when you thankfully escaped serious injury or worse? Um, you know, when I read the question, one of the things I thought of was a trip I was taking with a U.S. Secretary of Defense, and we were in Croatia. And um, we had gone into Bosnia. We had gone to Albania on that trip, too, I believe. And when we uh, we dropped off one plane, it was like an Air Force version of the 737, and we passed it off to a um, the U.S. Commerce Secretary, Ron Brown, during the Clinton administration. And we got on a different airplane on the E-4B, a big 747 that the Secretary of Defense uses. And Ron Brown, the Commerce Secretary, got on that 737 we were on with his delegation and took off and crashed into a mountainside and everyone was killed in uh, in Croatia. And my best girl was back here in Washington at the time. She was working in Georgetown. And everybody and uh, where she worked uh, became immediately where CNN was all over the story. And all they said was a uh, U.S. cabinet secretary, uh, uh, his airplane crashed and everyone was believed killed. And I was traveling over there with uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, cabinet uh, secretary and on an airplane, of course. And uh, so my best girl for a while. And uh, it was a crazy thing. We were in the air, and then we landed in Cairo, I think, and, and we got to the hotel, and the guy I was traveling with said, you know, I just talked to my wife, and she was crying and, and everything because she thought that I was killed, that we were all killed. And she said, you better, he said, you better call your best girl. I'm like, nah, she's fine. She doesn't think anything. <laughs> and and uh, so I didn't call right away. I, I, I've since learned. But I did uh, call after a few minutes, and I, I got my best girl on the phone. And sure enough, she was sobbing and all her, the women at work were crying because, because it was quite clear that I had just been killed. Uh, but I hadn't. Um, and I said, no, really, I'm uh, here. I am. I'm fine. And, uh, Ron Brown and everybody was, uh, was killed. Now that was, uh, that was a moment I've run out the clock on myself again, because Karen was, Karen was so great. 
But I'm going to get to I'm going to get to at least a couple more of the uh, mailbag questions. I, I always feel bad about this. I'm, I'm much too chatty. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's, uh, you know, it wasn't really a near-death experience, but it was, uh, you know, a bunch of people thought that I was uh, dead. My, my family uh, thought when the Pentagon was hit on, uh, on September 11th, uh, we had just lost our mother about two months earlier. And my, uh, one of my brothers in Chicago came racing up to his house. He was like, oh, my God, my mother died two months ago. Now Chris has been killed at the Pentagon. A plane just crashed into the Pentagon. And he didn't realize how big the Pentagon was. It's a big building. It was, uh, it was that, too. I uh, jumped out of planes with the Army a couple of times, but that was just fun, not, uh, not near death or anything. Now, uh, back to the mailbag with uh, what I can get in. Maybe I'll have to get to more tomorrow. Patriot Mom USA asks, when you and your best girl travel, who comes up with the idea of where to go next? And was there ever a place that you weren't crazy about going, but did go, you know, did it for her, and ended up really enjoying it, or vice versa? And I, a couple of stories occur to me, and one of them is Israel. And I'd, went wanting, I'd been wanting to take my best girl to Israel for some time. And she's like, eh, you know, I don't, there are a lot of other places to go. I'm not so hot on that idea. We were at a party one night. We were hanging out with uh, Israelis. And my best girl was over across the place talking to these Israelis. And at the end of the night, driving home, uh, she said, you know what? It's time to go to Israel. And I said, okay. So I wanted to go, but we're not going if she doesn't want to go. And then she said, all right, green light. We're going to Israel. And we went to Israel and uh, did a week um, because in uh, Tel Aviv and, well, all over the country and uh, the King David Hotel in Jerusalem and you know, outside the old city and great stuff. Had the time of our lives, want to go back, want to go back big time. Uh, I had wanted to take her there forever, uh, wait for the green light, uh, got the green light. Uh, Antarctica, where we went in uh, January, I had wanted to go since I was nine years old. And I talked about it, I, you know, six continents uh, had already uh, been checked, and Antarctica was the last and final uh, place, the final frontier. And, um, <clears throat> and my best girl uh, is the one who said, you know what, uh, Antarctica, we're going to Antarctica. You know, we went to Buenos Aires first and, and hung out there, where we'd been before on vacation. And then down to Tierra del Fuego and Ushuaia uh, to sail out of there. You know, I, uh, I want to go everywhere, uh, even the beephole places. My best girl prefers places that are not beephole places, but she's very adventurous. And, you know, uh, last year she decided that we're going to go to Moab, Utah and go skydiving. And uh, we did that. And I, I said, all right, that's what you want to do. That's what we're doing. Good stuff. So I'm not sure who comes up with the ideas. Uh, maybe not me. 